Good afternoon and welcome to the Brazos River Authority's Brown Bag on the Brazos. I'm Judy Pierce, Public Information Officer for the Brazos River Authority, and I'm your host for today's town hall meeting. Today we have three really interesting topics to discuss. Starting out, we're going to hear from Corey Skeins, our environmental department. He's going to share some of the stranger things we've seen over the years in, in the Brazos River Basin. Then we'll look at where we are with the ongoing drought with VRA Water Resources Planner, Dr. Peyton Lysenby. And then we're going to learn a little bit about one of the biggest undertakings in the Brazos River Basin in years, a new reservoir, uh, the Allens Creek Reservoir Project. So as always, we'll try to answer your questions at the end of our presentation, and we'll move on from there. So before we jump in, Let's do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, part of the purpose of being here today is to allow you to ask questions of the BRA. So at any time during a presentation, you can ask a question by typing it into the chat function. You'll find that icon in the upper right hand corner of your screen. And if we don't get to your question, please send us an email at information at Brazos.org and we'll be happy to respond to you in writing. So if you live in Texas and you've ever spent any time on the rivers or reservoirs, you may have seen things that might make you go, huh, what is that? Or why does the water smell like that? Um, seeing people or people coming from Texas from the outside that aren't used to seeing brown water might look at it and say, you know, why is it so brown? Um, but then what if the Brazos suddenly turns red? Or what if it suddenly has a really awful smell? Today we have Corey Skeins, one of our the BRA's aquatic scientists with us today to explain about some of the weirder things that they've seen occasionally. Um, I mentioned the water having some really awful smells. So why does it smell that way? Well, um, you can, there are uh, several different types of smells that you can get coming off the lake. Um, sometimes it smells like decay, um, which that's, it could be a dead fish in your vicinity. Um, if it smells kind of like rotten eggs, generally um, that's caused by lake turnover, which um, twice a year we'll have a lake turnover. Um, and in order to explain lake turnover, we have to understand uh, what lake stratification is. So in a lake, we have um, three different layers. Um, that's the epilimnion, which is the upper layer of the water body. The metalimnion, which is also referred to as a thermocline. Um, and then the hypolimnion, which is the bottom. They also call that. The so we're seeing that in these um, these graphics that you're. And here in these graphics, we can see that the, the epilimnion is that surface layer. Um, this chemocline or thermocline is where the metalimnion exists. And that can shift up and down depending on the time of year. Okay. Um, exactly where it is. And then the hypolimnion is that bottom, also called the bent of the sore. Um, and that's where there's a lot of like organic decay, like um, bacteria consuming organic matter, and stuff like that. Um, so with the stratification, um, in the fall to winter months, we'll have um, high winds, we have dropping temperatures, um, colder rain, stuff like that. That epilimnion is getting mixed with the ambient air. So in the summertime, it's, it generally is the warmer layer. Mm -hmm. um, but in the wintertime with those with those winds and rains and the dropping temperatures, it starts to cool down. Okay. The hypolimnion is that cold area. Um, that water is much colder. It doesn't really have any oxygen in it. And also, I forgot to mention that the epilimnion is getting oxygen. From, from the ambient air. So generally it has a dis high dissolved oxygen concentration. Okay. Um, with that wind, it starts to push that colder, that now freshly colder water down closer to the cold water that already exists. Mm -hmm. And what will happen is once those temperatures are fairly equal, the lake will just flip. Um, and um, in order to show that, it's a little bit blurry, but um, you can see what happens is the bottom, the hypolimnion comes to the top. Um, it doesn't generally uh, have like a, a murkiness to it or anything like that, but there in the bottom where that decomposition has been happening, um, 
that bacteria will release hydrogen sulfide. And that sounds scary, but it's really not. Um, it's just, that's what creates that sulfur smell. And so those gases just come to the top. Um, you can be driving near a reservoir and, and get that smell. You don't really have to be right on it okay. to get that smell. So it's the, the decaying matter on the bottom has been moved to the top and that's bringing that smell up. Really that decaying matter is probably still on the bottom but those those gases have been released. It's the gas that's mm -hmm. okay. Okay, great. Yeah. So this is pretty common. Um, I mean, how often do we expect to, to have this occur? So in deeper lakes um, where stratification does occur, that layering of the water, you can expect uh, lake turnover twice a year, once in the fall to winter month interface, and then again in that like uh, winter to spring uh, time period. with a major change of seasons so. yes yes um in the spring to, so in the in the the fall to winter the air is cooling and that colder water is going down in the summertime or in that like winter to springtime um the air is warming and so you'll have you'll have that turnover okay all right and generally it's a little Drive that. Or cause that to happen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we we have people that will um, call in and let us know that they're experiencing that smell also when we open the gates at one of the dams to make water releases. So is that similar? Yes, that's actually a similar mechanism. Um, sometimes when we open uh, the dam gates, it can suck water up from the bottom, and um, that's where that decay is. And so that smell is just kind of coming out. With okay. it. Yeah. And it's only temporary. It'll, you'll probably only get that as long as the gates are open. That's interesting. Well, what's the next topic you'd like to show us? Um, so if you've ever seen uh, foam on a, a water body or um, in some instances coming up over a, a, a road or anything like that, there's not soap in, in that water. Um, I mean, I guess it could be, but generally no. Um, that foam is caused by turbulence in the water. And what it's doing is it's kind of interacting with, again, that like kind of decaying organic material. Um, and it just causes bubbles and, okay. and it'll, it'll just bubble up. And that could be um, due to a dam release where a lot of force and a lot of water is coming out and it's hitting that material and it just pushes downstream. Um, in that bottom right hand picture, that's actually um, Highway 16 below the PK Dam at Possum Kingdom. And um, it was so turbulent that it caused foam to come up over the bridge there, if, if anyone's ever been in that area. Um, just a massive wall of foam, which is really crazy. So it's not usually that, that dynamic, I guess. Um, it's more normally like the, the next picture next to it, where it's just kind of a yes. a, a bit of a, a top there, it looks like soap on yes. the fast head. And that water um, on, in the picture on the left, that could be water that's coming over like a little low head dam or um, even like over a, a kind of a riffle or rapid type area, um, just flowing pretty hard over a, a uh, structure in a way where it's dumping off and interacting with the bottom and okay. kind of churning that up. So it's naturally occurring. Nobody has to add anything to the water to make that happen. It's no, just... not at all. Okay. Um, and those those bubbles will dissipate um, downstream and it's just, yeah, it's perfectly natural. Okay. Well, I know we, we've had other kinds of slimy kind of substances on the, the top of the water that people will call about. So what else um, do we have to take a look at. So um, if you've ever seen like a sheen on top of the water, um, you know, that doesn't necessarily indicate a negative environmental impact, but it can. Um, sometimes it could be gasoline or, right. or oil um, on the water surface, which um, due to the molecular structure, it sits on top generally. Um, and usually those are associated with some kind of odor you can smell that um, when those are occurring. Um, something that looks similar but is a little bit different is like a microbial sheen. Um, usually it's caused by bacteria. Um, 
bacteria like to eat things that are in the water column. And so they'll move up and, and consume minerals and stuff like that in the water. And once a lot of them get up to the surface, they can kind of bind together. Each individual bacteria can bind together and form almost like a like a, an organism, like a multicellular organism. And that helps protect them from environmental conditions or uh, could be other like stressors in their environment. Um, and, and it allows them to do what they do better. Okay. Um, so this picture that we see on the right that looks a little bit iridescent, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is um, a, a gasoline spill or an oil spill or anything like that, or even soap. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's actually a group of bacteria that causes that slime. That's right. And in, in both of those instances, those are both naturally occurring um, sheens that are on the water surface. Usually you'll find them in like still water. Um, okay. It's... I think like turbulent water is too much for them to kind of form those colonies and stuff okay. like that. Okay. So if somebody sees something that's slimy on the water like that, they don't need to worry about calling someone to come, you know, that there's been a spill. It could just be naturally occurring. I would say if there's not an odor that's immediately recognizable as something mm -hmm. man-made, uh, certainly not. Okay. So not necessarily a negative environmental condition. Correct. Just normal. Correct. Okay. All right. Well, I know there's there's lots of different water conditions that that we've we've had people call in and report, and um, and a lot of times it's it's actually algae um, in the water, mm -hmm. and um, quite often we we have gotten calls asking if it's golden algae. Yes. Um, so how does what does golden algae look like, and how does that affect the the lakes or rivers? Oh, uh, so uh, golden algae. There's a difference between like brown water that's caused by um, like suspended sediments and stuff in the water. Um, and when the water is kind of like golden in nature, like a like a cloud of, of yellow in a way, um, that cloud of yellow is going to be um, an algae bloom. Um, and in Possum Kingdom Reservoir and in Granbury is where we experience golden algae bloom. They tend to really only happen in the winter months, in those colder months when we get major blooms. That doesn't mean that it's not there in the summertime. Uh, okay. it, it exists all the time, and along with other things like phytoplankton and um, bacteria, other types of like uh, microscopic organisms. So it would only be golden when it's blooming then? Uh, yes, yes, okay. um, or at least noticeable. Okay. when it's blooming um, okay. and it can have small blooms large blooms and um, it's really those large blooms where we if they're toxic um, and where we might see a fish kill something okay. like that if you see like shad floating on the surface or other game fish okay can, so golden algae causes fish kills it can yeah okay um, right. not always but it interacts with their gills in a way that um they're unable to, to survive that. Um, and it's not in the entire water column. It's only where that algae is present. Okay. Um, its toxicity to fish has not been documented in like humans or other mammals or even birds. Um, so it's really not a, a concern for, for human health. Okay. Um, not in the way that like a blue green algae or a cyanobacteria is uh, where their toxicity can affect humans and other mammals. Um, so if you see a fish kill, you probably don't want to grab those fish up and, and take them home for dinner, but um, probably it's not, not but going to hurt you if you get in the water. No, no. And uh, I don't even know if uh, there's a buildup of those toxins in uh, fish tissue, but I, I'm not an epidemiologist yeah. or anything like that. So I can't make a recommendation on whether right. you should eat that fish or not. Yeah, I think I think the state health department usually says leave those. Yeah, out. just leave those alone. And and I know we usually have a large influx of uh, seagulls and pelicans uh, to help us out in, in getting rid of those fish when mm -hmm. we do have a fish kill. So yeah. um, it's probably best just to leave them alone. Which is interesting that those, it doesn't affect those birds. And so they can like kind of help, right. us, help us clean up a little bit. That's great. Yeah. Um, so just kind of on the toxicity a little bit, um, 
there was there were a couple uh, pets that had passed away in like the Austin area and even at Lake Belton recently. And, um, you know, it was in the news and based on the investigations, um, it wasn't anything like golden algae. Um, blue green algae has a toxicity that is in high quantities can be deadly to animals. And so uh, the ones in Austin were caused by blue green algae that was on Lady Bird Lake okay. around Red Butt Island. Um, it's a and that's if they drink the water. I think they're swimming in the water, okay. maybe like fetching, and so they're ingesting that water. Okay. Um, same with the the cyanobacteria at Lake Belt was was the um, determination there as well. And so. And again, it's them drinking it. But if if what if humans were to drink that water? I mean, um, I'm sure that be the best idea. No. You don't really want to ingest that, and it's probably best to stay out of the water stay if, if those are present. Yeah. Right. So. Good information. So, is there any other kind of weird topic that you'd like to fill us in on? Uh, when I think about weird water, um, I think about nightmare circulation, which um, it creates these white streaks on the reservoir. So, if you've ever been driving over a bridge, um, or like across a dam at a reservoir and it's a really windy day, uh -huh. um, you might see these white foamy streaks um, running up and down the lake. Mm -hmm. And um, when I took limnology in college, I was like, wow, that's really interesting. And so what happens is really high winds will blow down the, the fetch or the distance of the lake. And as it's blowing, it's causing the circulation in the water. And these opposing circulations or opposing currents converge. And in that spot where they converge, it creates a streak running down the lake. And it's foam and it may not be the same type of foam uh, as um, the foam we saw over Possum Kingdom or right. that turbulent foam. It could just be air bubbles that have been whipped up. Right. Um, but, but in lines, rather, kind of like the turnover of a lake, only it's in very small lines, very small. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so um, these streaks run um, parallel with the wind, um, okay. but perpendicular to the waves. So as waves are flowing like this, those streaks are running like this. That's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's just, it's a weird thing um, that is kind of neat to see on a windy day. Yeah, so many interesting things that are that are caused by nature um, mm -hmm. that are not toxic. They're not something to worry about. They're just interesting and different. Yeah, just completely uh, natural phenomena. Okay. Right. Well, is there a place that we can learn more about this? Yes. So um, on the BRA's webpage, there is a Weird Water Happenings webpage, um, and the link is up here. Uh, also, on Parks and Wildlife's website, they have a golden algae kind of a current status. Um, it's a really good resource if you're living on a lake or you see a fish kill or something like that. If you want to know if perhaps it was golden algae or something like that, um, you can go to the golden algae stats page and um, see reports of of golden algae. If it's occurring in your area, if what right. you're seeing is a fish kill caused by golden algae. Correct. Okay, great. Great resources. Wonderful. Well, great. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us about some of the weird things that happen in the Brazos, and we appreciate your time. We'll have you back again to talk about some other different topics that might not be so weird. Okay, so, well, thank you for having <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. All right. Well, just a really quick um, discussion about our board meetings. Uh, if you don't know, our board meets every other month. Um, our next meeting is not scheduled until March the 24th, uh, but if you'd like to attend, it is held at um, our Waco Central Office. Um, but we also do live stream our board meetings. So if you're interested in watching um, our meetings, you can go to website brazos.org on board day, and um, there's there'll be a little scrolling red line across the middle of the screen that you can click on and just get to that streaming event and watch it. And if for some reason um, you're not able to attend that day or you're not able to come to Waco that day, you, could, you can also um, go to our 
website to our board meeting minutes and you'll able you'll uh, see a little page down here on the right that shows you how you can click on each agenda item and just watch that entire video for that agenda item without having to watch the full meeting. So um, we invite you to come. Everyone is welcome. If you would like to address the board, there's always the three minutes at the beginning of each me uh, meeting to do that. And we welcome anyone that's interested in, in joining us. Okay, so I'd like to welcome Dr. Peyton Lysenby. He's a, it's his first visit to our brown bag on the Brazos. And um, he's going to tell us a little bit about the current drought status. Um, Peyton, last summer, uh, a lot of the, the NOAA Weather Service was saying that we were having really horrible dry drought conditions and that we might be saved by the weather changing to an El Nino uh, weather pattern, which is a little bit different than what we have been experiencing with the drought with La Nina. So um, recently we've we've had a lot of rain. Um, is that El Nino finally kicking in uh, to help us out? Yeah, so I, I would characterize it as we've we've received some of the uh, of the rain that we're really hoping to to start receiving in earnest last year in fall. Um, so the graphic on the screen now just showing the the amounts and the distribution of rainfall we've received since since last year in October. Um, it's it's been really patchy. So uh, some of the basins received a lot of rainfall uh, and we've seen some really marked benefits uh, from that rain. Other parts of the basin have been fairly dry. So I think there's a general consensus that El Nino has under delivered so far. Uh, I know there's a lot of folks in the central portion of the basin and the central portion of Texas that are really hoping El Nino picks up the slack rainfall wise as we move through the spring. Right. Um, so we're certainly hopeful in that regard. So not really hasn't solved all of our problems yet. Not quite yet. OK, so where are we in the current drought status situation? So uh, it's important to know that the, the, the drought we're experiencing currently and that we're continuing to experience really started in the fall of 2021. Um, and, you know, all droughts are a little bit different. Um, this time around, our northernmost lakes like PK and Granberry have actually fared really well. Uh, unfortunately, it's been our, our central western portion of the basin that's taken the brunt of the of the drought severity. And that's what's best described as our little river watershed, uh, which is depicted here. Um, and it includes the drainages uh, that all join the Little River. Uh, so its tributaries include the, the Leon River, the Passes River, the San Gabriel River. And um, really, this is the part of the Brazos Basin that had the most severe drought conditions since fall of 21. As you can see here, this is from October of last year, kind of mid-October, and you can see the expanse of exceptional drought conditions through the Little River system. Um, and that has really had an impact on our on our reservoirs that are located in this watershed. So that's you know, like Proctor, like Belton, like Stoss Hollow, like Georgetown. Those are the ones that really have shown the most, uh, I would say, response to these severe drought conditions. So um, over the course of the drought, you know, Lake Belton reached its lowest level since its current conservation pool has been established. Uh, so it, it hit 574.64 uh, last year on about October 25th, I believe, uh, which again, that's the lowest it's been since the late 70s. Uh, similarly, Lake Stillhouse Hollow also on October 25th reached its lowest level at about 602.14, and that's the lowest that that reservoir has ever been. Uh, since the late 60s, since it initially filled after it was after it was impounded. So um, you can see, the, you know, these reservoir levels clearly showing a potential response to these drought conditions. It's important to know as well that Lake Georgetown is gets a little bit of supplement from Lake Stillhouse Hollow, right? right? So we have a regional raw water line, the Williamson County Regional Raw Water Line that connects Lake Stillhouse Hollow to Lake Georgetown, provides a bit of supplemental inflow to Lake Georgetown. So with Lake Georgetown, when you're, if you're looking at a lake trace of its elevation, you have to kind of keep in mind that it's it's not showing you the full brunt of the drought because it has that supplemental right. supplemental inflow. Um, in the upper part of the basin, uh, Lake Proctor, for example, it's continued. It has been in stage four for some time now, um, and you know that and that record low elevation. Uh, on Lake Belton just goes to show you how severe the drought has been along almost the entire reach of the Leon River uh, in, the, in the Little River system. So with, with these record lows, um, recent rain events over the past couple of weeks have, have really brought up a lot of the reservoirs within our basin, but yep. they really haven't done very much for this area. Right. Um, just a bit of an increase. 
So um, again, the rainfall we've received has been very beneficial to the areas that received it, uh, which is a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. But these graphics show here show a comparison between that that mid-October kind of drought extent when it was very severe. You can, you know, the little river systems right here, you see that region of exceptional drought. This is the most recent um, drought monitor graphic came out this week. Uh, you can see that for the majority of the Brazos Basin, drought conditions have actually been completely removed, right? No drought remains. However, uh, the, the drought is still very stubborn in the Little River system. So we have some just a little bit of patch of extreme drought, some, some moderate drought, and then some abnormally dry conditions. Um, so uh, we're hoping that as we, you know, as we move through the spring, that we can continue to see some improvement in this portion of the basin. Here. Right. There are so many people that because they, they see their the reservoirs closest to them are thinking, well, that we're entirely out of drought conditions. So, um, you know, just that small area in the Little River Basin uh, is, is really still showing. So um, where are we with drought restrictions? Yeah, so um, first thing to note is, so you're right, several of our reservoirs have received substantial benefits. And like I mentioned earlier, the rainfall we've received has been really patchy, right? It's been really heavy in certain areas and, and really light in others. So um, Lake Limestone, Lake Somerville, they've nearly filled. They're pretty close to it uh, over the past several weeks. Lakes Whitney and Aquila have actually filled completely for the first time since the fall of 2019. That's what's depicted here. This is a USGS plot of Lake Whitney, which kind of shows the full expanse of the drought going back to fall 21 all the way through when it finally reached its, its full level again. And it uh, fills very quickly. Month. Yes, very yeah. rapidly. Um, so, um, basin wide, the system storage has improved as well, uh, which is very encouraging. But again, we're not seeing those gains being made substantially in the Little River system. Um, now, to walk through kind of system storage, this is uh, kind of a status graphic the BRA puts out every week. This is posted to our website. This is the one that came out this week. Um, and a bit of interpretational guidance here. Each of these columns represents one of our reservoirs. Uh, and you'll notice that we've had to kind of uh, twist the map around and make north point off to the left here to get right. everything to fit on the screen. But for each column, uh, the blue represents the, the storage amount, the amount of water in the reservoir. Obviously, the white would represent the negative space or the, the missing storage. So you can see, um, you know, our northern lakes like PK and Granbury obviously doing very well. There's Whitney, nice and full. Um, and then here's our, our kind of our three are three troublesome reservoirs that just can't catch a break Belton and Stillhouse and Georgetown these are you can see the 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 capacity is a, a bit lower in those so the the boxes if you do see a box around one of these columns that is an indicator of a drought stage uh, you know um, compliant with the BRA drought contingency plan though the color of those boxes indicates uh, what drought stage has been declared for that reservoir or for the system so you can see here that like Spelton, like Stillhouse Hollow, like Georgetown all have a pink bar around them that indicates that they're in a stage two drought warning condition. And even though they've received a little bit of rainfall, they've come up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, it's not really enough to convince us that they wouldn't go back down in the stage two conditions uh, if they don't continue to receive rain through the spring. So we're certainly hopeful that they will continue to receive rain, uh, but we're gonna continually monitor that. Now, the recent rains have also meant, like I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, Aquila and, and uh, Somerville and Granger, they've all filled. So we are currently in the process of rescinding those drought declarations. Um, and because of the improvement in system storage, we're currently 84% full system wide. We're also in the process of removing the stage one drought declaration, which is the big orange box here. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in the process of removing that for the entire system. So we've certainly had a lot of positive responses to this rainfall. Uh, again, though, it's, 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 Geographically discreet, uh, and we're really hoping that that this, as spring times progresses, we'll see more basin wide uh, benefits uh, from this rain. So what that means um, then, when we remove the drought status, that our customer cities and industries can then uh, remove the restrictions that they have on their own residents. Um, yeah. So I mean, certainly our our drought status indicates a you know positive trend, and the cities can then go forward and kind of use that as a as a key bit of information to make their own decisions about how. Moving right. forward. So there's a possibility that we're seeing light at the end of the tunnel for drought in the Brazos space. I would say there's certainly hope. Um, so right now, uh, at this glorious moment in time, all of the indications, right, near term, you know, the next few days, out to the next few months, all indicate that somewhere in central Texas, you're going to have an above normal chance of rainfall, uh, which is a very welcome, <laughs> very welcome forecast to have. Very welcome. Um, and we're very grateful for it. 
correspondingly, um, in terms of drought outlook, we're expecting to see improvement on that front. So this is the entire U.S. Uh, key in here, you know, this this little section here, right next to the Brazos River, that's the portion of the of the existing drought that's still in the Little River system. We're expecting to see if we can get, you know, if these forecasts come to fruition, we do have above normal rain that will have improvement. So the drought might actually be removed, or at least at a minimum, the condition will persist. Now. How that translates into increasing reservoir levels, we don't know, right? So it's not necessarily, that doesn't necessarily mean everything's going to fill up for the drought to be removed. We can have improvement in drought, uh, but we still have to monitor and make sure that we uh, are getting the rain to, to fill our reservoirs. Because right. to fill up a reservoir, it's really a, you need to hit a handful of key precipitation factors. Of course, you need the amount of rain. Uh, you need it to be a decent rate of rainfall. It needs to rain heavy. Uh, the location of the rainfall is important. Obviously, it needs to be upstream of your reservoir. And then, um, if you're not maybe getting the amounts you want, you need sequencing, multiple rainfall events. So if you can hit most of those factors, you can fill up a reservoir pretty quickly. So for reference here, this is the, the Whitney graphic again. Of course, Whitney filled. And I just want to turn your attention toward the right hand of the graph. And you can see that the lake made up several feet in a very short amount of time. And that's because it, it kind of came up sevens uh, on the on the uh, on the gamble of rainfall in terms of it got a good amount of rain it got it in the right spot and it was a, a good healthy heavy rain and that pumped a lot of water in that reservoir very quickly so that's that's the one thing that we continuously monitor is even as you know we're receiving kind of widespread rainfall is it in the right spots is it in the right at the right rate in the right place uh, the right magnitude uh, and to fill up our reservoirs and if so we should see that response now, if you miss a few of those factors, you may think you received a lot of rainfall, but then you won't see the reservoir respond that way because maybe it wasn't quite in the right spot or wasn't the, the right rate. And uh, so it can actually be quite difficult to fill the reservoir as, especially as the days are getting longer and the days are getting warmer and the demands start to increase as we move into the warmer parts of these. Um, now, uh, a key thing to note here is, you know, we started this conversation off talking about El Nino, right? So we'll finish it off there too, I guess. El Nino is at the moment forecasted to kind of move out as we go through the year. So we're still currently in a strong El Nino. That's what kind of reddish orange bars on this graph indicate. Mm -hmm. That's the percent chance of an El Nino condition, if you see the, the tall orange bar. As these orange bars decrease, you'll notice the gray bars, at least I think that's gray, gray bars coming up. So we see as we go through the spring, that's a neutral condition starting to take over, which means we're neither in El Nino nor La Nino. We're moving out of El Nino. So this is a transition period. And then as we move through the summer, um, you know, May to June, June to July, July to August, you can see the blue bar start to uh, make its presence known and start to increase. So this represents a transition from neutral conditions to La Nina conditions. Right. Um, now, early forecasts about this summer and later in the year have predicted that we're looking at maybe another hot and dry summer. How hot, how dry, we don't know. Typically, conventional wisdom says that La Nina is associated with drier conditions. Same conventional wisdom that tells us El Nino is associated with wetter conditions. However, during these transition periods, and you can look at this graph and see that for the majority of the year, we're going to be in some sort of transition. We're either transitioning into neutral conditions from right. El Nino or transitioning into La Nina conditions from neutral conditions. It is very difficult to predict impacts on rainfall and distributions and magnitudes of rainfall during those transition periods. So. I, I look at this and still see reason to hope because transition periods mean there's things are up in the air, things are right. moving. As long as things are moving, there's there's chances for rain, um, which makes me very happy. Well, realistically, um, you know, it, it could go either way. So right. even though we, we are coming out of a drought, um, as we saw in the last drought from 11 to, to 2015, we actually did kind of come up and then go back down That's and right. come up again yep. before the drought finally was gone for good. So. We're headed in the right direction, but we don't know that we're definitely done with drought. That's absolutely at right. At this point. Yeah, there's still, I mean, it just depends on where the rain falls and in what magnitude. Um, we, we, we've we seen improvements over the past few weeks, which we're very grateful for. Uh, again, they've been spotty. There's certain places that haven't seen the improvements, uh, but it's certainly possible as we transition out of this El Nino period that we re-enter some drought stages that maybe we've been fortunate enough to be right. removed right now, uh, but it's something we continually watch. Okay. Yep. All right. So what's the most important thing that you'd want to leave with people in the Brazos Basin about our current drought status or what we might be looking at in the future? Um, I, th I think it's a key thing to understand just how 
spatially, geographically variable drought severity could be. And that's especially true of such a large basin as the Brazos Basin, right? Some of the, you know, the dryness of a drought can vary dramatically as you move from one place to, to another. Um, and, and what that can mean is, you know, people's experiences of drought can vary differently depending on where they live in the basin, right? right? You may have the same, you, you say you live in the same basin, but you may have very different types of, of drought severity that you're facing. Um, I think that uh, our water supply system is set up, you know, by design to take advantage of that variability, right? We are reservoirs, our 11, you know, water supply reservoirs that we have located throughout the basin are distributed well so that we can take advantage of where it's wet, we can capture that water. And where it's dry, the water we've captured during the last time it was wet remains there as a reliable supply. Right. Um, so that's the that's the kind of the, the brilliance of the design. Yes, drought severity is very variable, but our system is set up to take advantage of that so that as a whole, our system remains resilient to, to drought severity and drought conditions. So even though someone might be looking at their lake and seeing that it's very low, they don't have to worry about, they're not gonna have water coming out of their face. Their lake is is doing its job. It caught that water, but it was wet. And now we're able to rely on that supply while it's dry. That's wonderful. Yeah. All right, well, we hope to have you back another time with some more good news, perhaps at the, our next Brown Bag in April. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Appreciate it. Cheers. All right, well, good news and, and hopefully more positive news coming. Well, uh, I, I don't see any questions at this point, but you know, again, if you'd like to ask your question uh, anytime during this meeting, we still have some time. And if you um, if you don't have any questions that you'd like to ask right now, you can always send us an email at information at brazos.org. We'd be happy to answer your questions uh, uh, in writing, or you can even give us a call. Uh, we are available out of the Waco office. Our uh, We have a toll-free number, 888-922-6272, so you can reach us um, both ways. All right, so our next speaker, John King, Special Projects and Strategic Initiatives Manager. And we're very excited to have you on today because okay. not only is your first visit to us on the Brown Bag, but it's also with some really great news. Um, we are looking at building a reservoir and it's it's been a long time coming. So tell yeah. us a little bit about, about Allen's mm -hmm. Reservoir and what we can, look forward to in the near future. Absolutely, I'll start with kind of a, a Cliff Notes background on it. You know, it's been talked about a lot and a lot of folks already know, but originally this project site was permitted to be a, a cooling water reservoir for a nuclear power plant. And that was back in the 1970s. So fast forward several years and they decided not to pursue the project. And we had the opportunity in early 2000s to become a partner on the project and try to get it moving then. Well, there were some challenges to that, and luckily for us in 2022, we were able to become the sole owner of the project. So now we control our destiny in it, and we're really looking forward to getting it moving. Uh, shit, there is, as far as like what the project is, our project site is located in Austin County. Uh, it's in between the cities of Sealy and Wallace. The project site itself is approximately 10,000 acres. Um, it's uh, going to have components including an earthen embankment. There'll be a pump station intake on the river itself to allow us to move water when the river flows allow and uh, store it there for use later on. Okay. So what we're looking at right now is really kind of an artist's rendition of what it will look like once it's built. Absolutely. This is just a con concept and, you know, depending on the studies that we have to go through, that configuration can change and it could look you know, a little bit different than that. But at least for now, it's something to use as a visual. This is what we have. And uh, in our water rights permit, we're going to be able to impound a little over 145,000 acre feet. And out of that, we'll be able to supply almost 100,000 acre feet for use each year. That's right. So that, that we're looking at the Brazos River next to it on the right. That is correct. And so un unlike um, some of our other reservoirs where the Brazos kind of flows in with, at, at the top end and flows out at the bottom end, this is a little bit different. That is correct. It'll it'll pull water from the river like we talked about. It's um, not on the main body of the river. It is. It will impound um, Allen's Creek, which is kind of the namesake for it. It does cut through this rendition of it, and there'll be a facility to allow us to do low flow releases if we there could possibly be a tainter gate type setup if we needed to do larger releases. So all that will be evaluated as we work through this process and determine what the best configuration for this project is. 
Okay, so we're at the very beginning of this project, really. We, we are at the starting line, okay. absolutely. So what, what comes next? So what now, uh, there's a little bit of activity now and a lot more to come, I guess you'd say. We've got some preliminary studies and analysis that's ongoing to help kind of get this thing ready to go when we do move forward with the next step. And the next big step is our permitting design consultant selection. We're going through that process now. Our solicitation closed at the end of last year, looking for someone to come in, help us put all these pieces together. Because Allen's Creek in itself, the, it's a very large project in itself, but it has all these large projects associated with it. You're gonna have an intake structure that diverts water from the main stem of the Brazos to fill it. And like we talked about, you could have up to, you know, over a two mile long earthen embankment, a spillway structure, a low flow outlets. All of those things have unique um, nuances and considerations that have to be considered when you look at it in the totality of the Allen's Creek Reservoir System project. Okay, so we're looking at hiring an, an engineering firm that would serve as an, an umbrella to all these other projects that need to come underneath it, um, environmental studies. Absolutely, all of those things kind of work hand in hand through this process. and. What you can't afford to do is go out into the vacuum and just focus on design without considering you know, what implication the environmental studies are gonna show us. And it's a little bit of an iterative process. It'll, uh, we may take a step forward and step back through that and, and learning as we go, but that's just part of it. And you know, we're being diligent with our efforts to make sure we select the best team that we can and, and provide the most benefit for this project. Okay, so I, I know the next step, once we hire this organization, will be um, to start the federal 404 permitting process. Could you talk about that just a little bit? Absolutely, that's a, you know certainly one of the critical paths of getting this project online and that the 404 process is actually a section of the Clean Water Act and it has to do with any time you fill or dredge wetlands or waters of the U.S. Um, we will prepare all this information, do all of these studies to compile and submit them to the Corps of Engineers, who will be the lead agency for us and get, helping us ultimately get the permit issued. Okay. Um, it's a, The types of things we're going to look at are what impacts does the project have? And the, each one of the components I talked about, you know, are there ways to look at alternative designs? What measures could we do to mitigate those impacts? And just having that thoroughly um, analyzed and documented so that we can give them the best information available as they do their review process. When we talk about impacts, we talk about things like threatens and endangered species, um, cultural resources, water quality, floodplain is another big one, and a multitude of others. It also involves a lot of agency coordination besides the Corps of Engineers and EPA. It's also TCEQ, Parks and Wildlife, uh, You've got the Texas Historical Commission, FEMA, and you know that's a whole nother laundry list. So a lot of engagement goes into it. It's it's a timely process. It takes some time, but it's it's the way to get this project moving forward. Okay. Well, it's a start. It is a start. It is a start. Right. So Absolutely. thank you very much for joining us to give us an update on where we'll be going, and hopefully over the next several months we'll we'll be back again to talk about the progress of this this whole project. Absolutely. As we get moving and have more information, we'd love to come back and share it. And it's an exciting project. It's going to impact. I can't think of a part of this organization it won't impact. So it's going to have far reaching. So we're ready to get going. Good to know. So we won't be seeing um, earth movers out there very soon. Um, no, that's correct. Yeah, it, it, it is a it is a process. Now, anything we kick out now is, you know, just in our best judgment and based on what we've seen other projects take. But the permitting process, you know, it, it could take five to 10 years. It's a long term deal. And then on top of that, when you do get a permit issued, then you're dealing with a large construction project and right. it wouldn't be unreasonable for a four to seven year timeline on top of that. OK. So. So we've got a way to go, but we are starting out. We got a way to go, but we've got the right people. Good deal. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Judy. So I, it doesn't look like we have any questions this time. So um, I'd like to just thank everyone for coming out and um, and we would be happy to have you join us for the next one. So um, as I said, we have a board meeting coming up at the end of March. If you're interested in what might be on that agenda, please go to our website at brazos.org and you'll be able to see the, the agenda just before the board meeting. And then we will have another brown bag on the Brazos scheduled for the first week in April. So 
Thank you again for joining us. We hope you enjoyed the topic. And if you have any questions, please send us an email at information at and we're happy to answer your questions. Have a great afternoon, everyone.